Good afternoon and welcome to this joint program of the Commonwealth Club and the University of San Francisco School of Management. I'm Elizabeth Davis, uh, Dean of the University of San Francisco School of Management and your chair for the program. USF is the oldest university in San Francisco with a founding mission to change the world from here. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's distinguished guests, Catherine M. Gale, business leader, author, and speaker, Michael E. Porter, economist, advisor, and professor at the Harvard Business School. Their presentation today is entitled, Why Competition in the Politics Industry is Failing America? Many Americans are really horrified about the dysfunction and the abysmal results uh, from Washington, D.C., and our speakers today argue that they have a very realistic approach to changing this. They say our political problems are not due to a single cause, but rather to a failure of the nature of the political competition that has been created. In other words, a systems problem. Catherine Gale was president and CEO of Gale Foods, a $250 million high-tech food manufacturing company in Wisconsin. Her career includes roles in the private and public sectors, including at Oracle Corporation, Bernstein Investment Research and Management, Mayor Richard M. Daley's office at the city of Chicago, and the Chicago Public Schools. In 2018, uh, she co-founded Democracy Found, a Wisconsin-based initiative mobilizing bipartisan group, a uh, bipartisan group of leaders to implement electoral innovations in Wisconsin. She holds an MBA uh, from the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern. Michael Porter is an economist, researcher, speaker, and teacher. Throughout his lifetime uh, career at Harvard Business School, he's brought economic theory and strategy concepts to bear on many of the most challenging problems facing corporations, economies, and societies, including market competition and company strategy, economic development, and the environment and healthcare. He's the author of 19 books and over 130 articles, and is the most cited scholar today in economics and business. Dr. Porter holds an MBA from Harvard and a doctorate from Harvard's Department of Economics. Today, we'll have a very rare visit with two of America's top business thinkers as they turn their focus to realigning America's political system through the Gale Porter Politics Industry Theory. Please welcome Catherine Gale and Michael Porter. Thank you, Dean Davis. Thank you, George. And thanks to all of you for being here. We are pleased and honored to spend this time with you today. I'd like to just start quickly with a story about my daughter. A couple of years ago, she was nine years old and we were in the car, and I said to her, hey honey, did you know that our national debt is $19 trillion? She loves being in the car with me. And she said, really? I said, yeah. And guess who's gonna have to pay that back? Now she's horrified in her face, and she says, you? Oh, oh. So cute, but no, that's not how it works. You're going to have to pay that back. And she turned and said, me? What did I ever do? <laughs> so as you can see from these conversations that I force upon my daughter in the car, I care deeply about politics, policy, and the trajectory of the country. And Michael and I do this work together because we are both concerned about that trajectory and the failure of Washington, D.C. to deal with any of our most critical problems. Now, there's so much talk all the time today about hyperpartisanship and all the division in the country, so I want to start with one thing on which absolutely everybody does agree. Washington is broken. Washington is broken. We say it all the time. And yet, as my good friend, former Congressman Mickey Edwards, first realized, this statement reflects a profound misunderstanding of the true problem. In fact, 
Washington is working exactly how it's designed to work and delivering exactly what it's designed to deliver. Rational question, how can the political system be so perfectly designed and yet deliver such dismal results? And the answer is that it's simply not designed for us. In fact, the system has been custom designed, maintained, fine-tuned over, over a long period of time by and for the benefit of two private gain-seeking organizations. These are our major political parties and their industry allies, what together comprise what we call the political industrial complex. And this duopoly is fundamentally the only constituency that matters. So I'm going to look for the clicker and move to a Venn diagram that really, in a simple way, encapsulates the current problem. There is currently virtually no intersection between Congress acting in the public interest and the likelihood of their being reelected. So in other words, if America's representatives do their jobs the way we need them to, they're likely to lose those jobs. So let's think about that. Fortunately, we can fix this. In 2016, I asked Michael to join me on a new approach to our political problem using this lens of competition thinking and industry analysis that he pioneered to understand competition in other industries. And using these tools to look at politics sheds new light on the failures because politics has become a major industry that functions like other industries. And as the dean said, our problems are not attributable to a single factor, but rather to a failure of the nature of the competition that's been created. This is a systems problem. Michael and I were very clear right from the start that the last thing we wanted to do was simply add to the depressing commentary about politics, but rather to endeavor to figure out what it would take precisely to change the system, not for change's sake, but in order to change the results that the system regularly delivers. Please note that when we talk today, it's about politics, but it's not political. Michael's a Massachusetts Republican. I used to be a Democrat. Before there was a libertarian. Now I'm a centrist independent, sort of kind of covering everything here. <laughs> and the problem is not Democrats or Republicans or even the existence of parties per se. The problem is this nature of competition. So first, Michael's gonna tell you what's at stake, and then I'll come back and tell you why everything's screwed up, who's to blame, and most importantly, how we can fix it. Michael. Thank you, Catherine. Well, I think that introduction hopefully gets us started down the path that we have to understand if we are going to actually uh, change the trajectory uh, of our political system, which uh, I think we're all going to understand is, is really now imperative. Um, so, uh, as, as you know, I'm a strategy professor, uh, but also an economist working on economic development. And I can tell you that uh, a few years ago, uh, politics was literally the last thing I thought I would ever work on. Uh, this was not what I did. Um, but that changed, and it actually changed because of Catherine, who helped me understand that this is so much at stake in terms of our country's future, then we can't not look at this. We can't ignore it. Um, so in 2010, I began co-chairing a multi-year project at HBS, the US Competitiveness Project. We at the school decided that we would try to do deeper search to understand America's disturbing economic performance that we've been experiencing now for decades that began well before the Great Recession. It wasn't the Great Recession that started it. It had already started. Why was that going on? Now this, uh, this chart, uh, hopefully, uh, yes, uh, hopefully you can all read it. Uh, it it's, a, it's kind of a summary of what we found about the U.S. economy. What are its strengths? What are its weaknesses? Where are we gaining? Where are we losing? And what we see is that America has great strengths. Those are in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, but we are facing a growing away, array of alarming economic weaknesses. Well known to all of you. Worker skills. 
eroding labor market flexibility, poor infrastructure, complex regulation, our legal system, an unsustainable federal budget, uh, a corporate tax system that's still not fixed, and much more. Uh, interestingly, if you look at this chart, uh, you see that in the upper right-hand corner, which is where the strengths are, uh, these are all areas that are really in the private sector. If you look in the lower left-hand quadrant, where all the weaknesses are and where we're getting worse, we see that those areas are almost universally the responsibility of government. And uh, something's broken in our government because we can't seem to make progress on those weaknesses. When we asked our alumni about where they would put our political system on this chart, uh, uh, they put it where you see it. They identified the political system actually as our most significant economic problem and getting worse because it was blocking progress on dealing with these fundamental drivers of competitiveness in our economy. Uh, we then made a kind of a naive move. We, we created at HBS the eight-point plan, which was the most critical policy uh, progress we needed to make in Washington if we were going to really jumpstart our economy again. And we made multiple trips to Washington and m met many members of Congress. And virtually every single one we talked to said that our diagnosis is correct. This is right. And then they also said that uh, they agreed with what needed to be done. We had to fix these things. But nothing got done. Now, our economic performance uh, is concerning enough, but the deeper we dig here, the more the story gets worse. It's not just our economic performance. Uh, the economic agenda in a, in a society uh, is only half the job. We need to make progress on the social agenda if we are to make progress on the economic agenda. Uh, and on the social agenda, most of us start out with the idea that, oh, we're doing pretty well. We've had a great history uh, a, as a leader in social progress in, in America on many areas. Uh, but, and many of us think of ourselves as a leader uh, compared to other countries in the world, but there's been no objective data to actually benchmark ourselves on this area. And so I led a group uh, over a number of years that created this data, a benchmarking data that would allow us to compare ourselves on many dimensions of social progress in America uh, to many, many other countries. It was introduced in 2014. It's called the Social Progress Index for any of you that are interested. So let's take a look at how we're doing on the social agenda. Uh, and the answer is not good. Not good at all. This chart actually compares uh, U.S. to the other uh, OECD countries. These are the advanced economies in the world, um, and there's 36 of them. And based on the real data, you can see some of the key findings. Uh, you can see that on uh, the question of uh, uh, you know, maternal uh, mortality, for example, which is down here in the lower left, we are actually 35th out of 36 OECD countries. Child mortality, 33, and so on. Homicide rate, 34. Um, the US has really fallen behind on moving the social agenda forward. We're sinking uh, compared to other countries. Uh, and this is just a sample, there's much more that I could show you, and, and, and the conclusion is all the same. Not only are we not a leader in social progress anymore, but our social performance is actually declining. We're one of the few countries in the world where that's actually taking place based on our data. Um, and this lack of progress on the social agenda is one of the key reasons why we're having economic problems. These things are synergistic, and unfortunately the synergism now is negative. Now, as a result of this work, we finally had the data to actually measure how our government is performing on the most important things we have to get done. Um, and uh, this both frustrated me and also mystified me. How could this be? We know what we need to do. We know what we have to fix. Uh, we're a country that historically gets things done. 
That's been one of the uniquenesses of this country. How could we fix this? I didn't know. I had no idea. Uh, uh, and, and, and what happened was that I knew Catherine. And Catherine had spent a significant period of her life really digging into the political system and the political system uh, and, the, and the processes that, that it, com- it consists of. And she told me something that I really had a hard time swallowing. She said, there's absolutely no way that any of this is ever going to happen changing these things uh, and no matter how many times I go to Washington, and no matter how many plans HBS puts forward, they're not going to work. And this, this was a difficult message to swallow, because we all hope that we can make, make progress. Um, I, like many people, had made a fundamental mistake in thinking about the problem we're having. I, like many, thought we had a policy problem or a politician problem, the wrong people. And Catherine understood that actually what we really have is a political system problem. The system is designed so that it can't solve problems, and it won't solve problems. And then she had a real breakthrough idea, and a brilliant idea, which was that we could look at politics as an industry and look at how competition in that industry had evolved and emerged and how that was really one of the root causes of what was actually going on in terms of what we do or don't get done. So I joined Catherine in this work uh, in early 2016. I've now become obsessed with it. (laughs) The, The reason is that it's so consequential. Imagine if these numbers don't change. Imagine if we continue to decline. Uh, uh, what, what's going to happen to this great country? Uh, and so what I'd like to do is, is kind of hand it back over to Catherine and start to open up this question of why is this happening? What's causing our democracy not to be able to address these important problems? And, and so Catherine, let me turn it over to you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. So I want to go back again to this Washington is broken. And as we said, that's not actually the case because it's working how it's designed to work. And it's designed by and for the benefit of the political industrial complex, not for citizens, not for voters, and certainly not for the long-term public interest. I'd like to take a peek under the proverbial hood because whenever we do that, we find out that politics really works very differently than certainly what I had assumed, what most of us had assumed. So I'll, ta- I'll give you an example. So remember when Joe Biden in 2009 becomes vice president, his Senate seat is now open in Delaware, and everybody in Delaware knew who was going to be the next senator from the state of Delaware because it's a guy named Mike Castle. He's the most popular politician in the state, multiple-term congressman and governor. But you've never heard of Senator Mike Castle because he ran in his Republican primary and he lost. This was shocking really shouldn't have been an insurmountable problem because that's just the primary. Mike Castle could turn around and put himself on the ballot in November as an independent, and he would have won. Problem. Delaware has a rather odd law, and it's called the sore loser law. (laughs) And what that says is if you lose your party's primary, Republican or Democrat, you are not permitted to have your name on the general election ballot in November, no matter what the people in your state want. So I think a rational question is, how many states have a law like this crazy Delaware people law? And the answer is 44. Now today, we're actually sitting in one of six that do not have a sore loser law, so kudos to California. I want, to, I want you to remember when Connecticut Senator Joe Lieberman lost his Senate primary in 2006, he, did, and he put himself on the ballot in November as an independent and was reelected proving that that's who the voters in his state wanted. But the only reason he could do that is because Connecticut was one of then only four states who didn't have the sore loser law. This, there's a few other things I'd like you to know about partisan primaries. 
They might be publicly funded, but when we think about it, they're actually selection processes for these private organizations. And primaries are the key reason why so many people show up at the general election and think, I really don't like the choices that I have, because most elections are really decided in the primary, especially in gerrymandered districts, and voters who turn out for partisan primaries tend to be further to the right or the left than the electorate as a whole. And therefore, to make it through the primary, candidates have to move further to the extremes. And even more alarming, and this is missed a lot, the partisan primary influence extends far beyond who gets elected and perverts the actual legislative process. So it's, it's not just what you have to say to get elected. It's once you're in office and let's say you're presented with an opportunity to sign a bipartisan compromise landmark legislation bill on one of these issues that Michael had up here. The questions that you might want to ask are, is this a good idea? Is this the right policy for the country? Is this what the majority of my constituents want? But it's actually none of these. The operative question that you have to ask is, will I make it back through my low turnout partisan primary if I vote for this? And if the answer to that question is no, as it often is, the answers to the other key questions are virtually wholly irrelevant because the rational incentive to get reelected directs you to vote no. Now, occasionally, duty and principle and conscience, you might vote yes anyway, in opposition to what your leadership wants you to do, your side of the political industrial complex. And what happens then? You'll be threatened with a primary. And primary is not just a noun anymore. It's now an action verb, as in we're going to primary you. And what that means if you're a Republican is we're going to run someone further to your right if you're a Democrat, it means we're going to run, run someone further to your left. Never, never has it meant that we are going to run a more reasonable, rational, consensus-oriented, compromise-seeking, moderate to the middle. And partisan primaries, combined with partisan gerrymandering, are two of the key tools that the political-industrial complex uses to control this political process, and they effectively force our elected officials to the right and to the left, and this makes it very difficult to govern we can start to understand some of the fundamental dynamics that lead us to getting so little done in Washington, D.C. Now, quickly, I'll give you another example of our partisan system, and this one isn't from elections, it's from legislating. So the duopoly also perverts governance by controlling the legislative machinery. That's our term for the norms, practices, rules that dictate the process by which laws are made. You might have heard of the Hastert rule. This rule is a particularly egregious example of party control taking precedence over the legislature's ability to work collectively, even when citizens want it. The Hastert rule has become a well-accepted practice of all speakers of the House. The speaker will not allow a floor vote on a bill unless a majority of the majority, which is to say a majority of the speaker's party, support that bill even if a majority of the country supports it or a majority of the House would vote to pass it. So unless speakers ignore this practice, which they do from time to time, but rarely, even legislation supported by a majority of the country or a majority of the House has absolutely no chance of passing because there'll never even be a vote in our democracy. Let's consider our 2013 government shutdown, which unfortunately is now the shutdown before the last shutdown. That ended, oh, that, that shutdown could have been entirely averted or ended earlier if then Speaker John Boehner had allowed a floor vote on legislation that was already passed by the Senate and that was from the start supported by a majority of the House, which is to say, virtually you know, all the Democrats plus a minority of Republicans. And in fact, the shutdown ended only when Speaker Boehner broke the Hastert rule and broke with his party to allow the vote. Effectively, this made-up rule cements majority party control in a legislature that's supposed to represent all U.S. citizens, and it allowed a small number of extreme partisans to hold the country hostage in a shutdown for 16 days. 
So let's think about it for a moment in the context of your own organizations. If you were committed to solving your biggest problems, I suspect one thing you might not do is get everybody into the room and say, oh, just a moment, hold on, let's count off by twos and divide into warring teams, and then we'll get straight to work. Whoops. But that's effectively Washington, D.C. every single day. Believe it or not, our founders warned against political parties in prescient terms. John Adams said, there is nothing which I dread so much as a division of the Republic into two warring teams, two great parties, each arranged under its leader and concerting measures in opposition to each other. Clearly, politics just doesn't work quite the way Schoolhouse Rock once told me that it did. My daughter of the debt story um, has been affected, so she now describes the situation best with a joke, and I, I promise to share it. Um, if con is the opposite of pro, then isn't Congress the opposite of progress? <laughs> she, she could probably do this better. Um, it turns out that most of the rules that govern the incentives that drive day-to-day -day behavior and legislation are, as you might imagine, set by and for the benefit of the political industrial complex. And as is always the case in life, the rules of the game affect the way the game is played. And the net result of the rules of the game in politics industry is unhealthy competition. Unhealthy competition in elections and unhealthy competition in legislating. And the net result of unhealthy competition is that customers are not well served. So thus, the actors in the political system are absolutely thriving while the American public has never been more dissatisfied. Just last fall, a new Gallup poll came out, and 61% of Americans think a new party is needed. And the percentage of Americans self-identifying as independent is at an all-time high in July, 43% versus the 29% saying Democrat and 25% saying Republican. In any other industry this big, with this much customer dissatisfaction and only two players, some entrepreneur, I think from Kellogg, Michael thinks from HBS, <laughs> but would see this as a phenomenal business opportunity and they would create a new competitor responding to what customers want. But that doesn't happen in politics. <laughs> because as Michael will show you, the parties work very, very well together in one particular way. And that is to rig the rules of the game to protect themselves jointly from new competition. Said another way, politics isn't broken, it's fixed. Thank you, they didn't laugh last night. It's very disappointing. Okay, therefore, instead of results in the public interest, we get gridlock. Oops. This chart shows the percentage of salient issues deadlocked in Congress. We see a relentless increase from 1947 to today, leading to a high watermark of 74% of issues gridlocked in 2014. And everyone knows it's broken. Look at the dramatic decline in public trust in the federal government from 1958 to 2017. Now, if the competition in the politics industry were healthy, industry actors would be competing to advance the public interest, and they would be held accountable for that. But we know they're not. There's no accountability in politics because the only thing that either side has to do to win an election is to convince you to vote for them as the lesser of two evils or to vote for them because at least they say they're for what you believe. What they don't have to do is deliver results because no matter how disappointed you are, you likely still prefer what your one side says they're for than what the other one side says they're for. Let's look deeper into this. Why is this so? I'll turn it back to you, Michael. Thank you, Catherine. Well, you can see the conundrum, the complexity of what's going on here, uh, or most, most accurately, what's not going on. 
Um, and to understand uh, how and why this political competition that has been created diverges so sharply from the public interest, we now need to dig down into the tools that we use for analyzing competition. What drives competition? Uh, and here, uh, those of you that are business school students, you've probably been exposed to the five forces. Uh, and this is a framework for looking at industries. And, um, and it's also really cool around uh, when the new Star Wars movie comes out. Um, in any event, um, what is the five forces framework? Well, essentially it says that an industry competition is kind of the interplay between the various actors. And there's some act, kinds of actors that are present in, er, in every industry. At the core of competition is the rivalry, the head-to-head -head rivalry between the competitors. In this case, the rivals are the Republicans and the Democrats. It's like Coke versus Pepsi. It's like General Mills you know, versus Kellogg's. Uh, and the nature of how these rivals compete uh, is fundamental uh, to the results that uh, we see the industry uh, delivering. Uh, but competition, as you see here, it's not just the rivals. There's also these surrounding actors that have a, often a profound influence on, on what competition looks like. Uh, there's, of course, the customers. That's us. We're citizens. We're customers. This is supposed to be delivering value for us. But as we'll see, all customers are not equal in the politics industry. Um, uh, we reach customers in this industry through various channels. You, you can see those here. Uh, you know, direct voter engagement, ground game, uh, advertising, and so forth, the media, uh, social media. Uh, and these are ways in which the parties, you know, connect and deliver information uh, to the voters. Um, there's suppliers. In any industry, you need inputs, you need talent, you need resources to actually do the job of, in this case, running elections and governing. Uh, and we can see the key uh, suppliers here. N not just candidates, but also campaign talent, uh, people that are pollsters and so forth, voter data. You know, we have terribly sophisticated data now on everything about us voters because it allows the parties to be very efficient, very effective in how they kind of reach out to us. Think tanks who come up with ideas. Uh, and then lobbyists who are uh, paid to go out and try to influence what happens in, in, uh, you know, in policy making process. So there, that's another key actor. Um, and then there's uh, what we call uh, the threat of new entrants. Uh, and the threat of new entrants are somebody that comes in to compete with the existing rivals, uh, and that would be a new party. Um, and the question we have to answer is, well, why hasn't there been a new party, given all the dysfunction that we see in the existing uh, competition? And the answer to that is, we've got to understand what are the barriers to entry? What makes it hard for a new party to get established? Um, and uh, as we'll see, uh, it's, it's got to be hard because we haven't had a new party for well over 100 years that's been successful. Um, and then finally, every industry has what we call substitutes. These are uh, different ways of competing in the industry than the traditional way of competing. It's like Uber and taxis. And the, the substitutes are often the disruptors. Um, and, and the question is, uh, you know, here the most likely disruptor would be independence. People coming in and running as independents, not affiliating with a party. If we look at the industry this way and we see these actors and we see these el influences, we can start to understand what's going on. So let's talk about that. Uh, it's, a, it's a complicated competition. Understanding how the parties think and how they have chosen to compete is complicated. We'll focus here on some of the key dimensions, but uh, uh, I, we, we hope that you'll read a, a, a book that we're now uh, getting well along on that, to get into the real nitty gritty here, because we have to understand this really, really clearly if we're gonna do anything about it. So the, the first thing we, uh, we need to understand is the, the industry um, is, a duopoly. Thank you. That was a nice suspense. <laughs> um, so when you have a duopoly, that means there's two and only two dominant competitors. And that has a huge impact on the way the competition takes place. It's much different than if there were more competitors. 
the most important customers in the politics industry are not the average voter. It's very hard to take as an average voter. Uh, why? Well, in any industry, savvy competitors find the most profitable customers. The ones that deliver them or the, give them the most benefit. Uh, and in politics, of course, value for the parties is reliable votes. People that show up and vote for the party's side of the, of the game. And then money, of course, because this is a very high high cost industry these days. Billions of dollars are spent in this industry. Um, instead uh, of average voters, the core customers here are partisan primary voters. From listening to Catherine, you know why. And special interest. People that care fundamentally and deeply about some issue, whether it's public education or whether it's X, Y, and Z. And are very, very committed to getting their way on that particular issue. Uh, the parties focus the vast majority of their attention on serving these two groups, the partisan primary voters and the special interests. Um, and because the voters only have these two choices, as Catherine mentioned, the duopoly doesn't actually have to deliver any results to the average voter to win elections and, and, and say uh, uh, in a duopoly. Essentially, they take the average voter in the general election for granted, and if you don't vote, you're virtually ignored. The duopoly in this competition is free to focus on these core customers, uh, the, the partisan primary voters and the special interests that are aligned with their ideological uh, stance. Now that leads to the next really critical thing to understand, and that is that political competition, today certainly, is not based on solving problems. It's based on ideology. The party wants to, 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 to do things that will align with their ideological stance. Uh, uh, and what we know is that ideology is a cartoon. It's too simple. It's a stylized view of the world. It's not the real world. Real solutions to real problems are not simple. It's not big government versus small government, you know. It's much more complicated than that. Uh, and yet, uh, uh, the competition today is much more about being on the ideological side that you want to come out on as opposed to whether we actually solve the problem. And the parties have created this idea that there's this choice between big government and small government or regulation and no regulation. These are false choices. It's not that simple. It's somewhere in between. Uh, it involves co its complexity and, and uh, in many cases, uh, compromise. Uh, this partisan competition that I'm describing, which is about getting it our way uh, rather than the way that works, is uh, really reinforced by the fact that the part par parties now control the key suppliers and the key channels for reaching voters. Uh, again, uh, campaign consultants today are either Democrat or Republican campaign consultants. If you work on a Republican campaign, you will never, ever, in all of history, work on a Democratic campaign. You're, 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 you're locked into one side or the other. The same is true in uh, the media, increasingly. You're, you know, you're locked into this set of media or that set of media, and the media are locked into you. And what we have is these two sort of diametrically different camps facing off against each other and struggling essentially to have things fit their view of the world as opposed to the view of the world that's more complicated and more realistic and it might actually matter. The final point here I want to make is that despite the failure to deliver results, progress on all those issues we talked about earlier, there is no new competition. Uh, uh, the parties primarily, by themselves, deliberately have created very high barriers to entry that make it very hard for a new party or even independent to, to get a, a, a foot in the ground. Uh, these are incumbency advantages, as we say in business, uh, brand, you know, tradition, and so forth, economies of scale. They're run parties are running campaigns all across the country. And there's real efficiencies that a new party or an independent is really up against a huge barrier. Uh, 
the parties control the talent. They control the, the channels. Uh, it's hard for a new competitor to even get taken seriously by the media uh, and, and hire a campaign staff. And uh, just as an example of that, you might be interested to know that the duopoly created a rule on fundraising that allows a single donor to contribute $847,500 annually, every year, to a national political party. But if you're an independent, the rule says you can only get $5,400 <laughs> per election cycle, and that's two years. Okay, this is a completely made up rule. And as Catherine said, the parties are very good at collaborating on making up these rules that benefit them. Uh, and therefore, we don't see a new party. We, we have had no new party in this country since 1854. And independents have a tremendous struggle working their way through this labyrinth of barriers that have been uh, created. Now let me conclude my, my part of discussing this competition by hopefully not depressing you too much more, but it's depressing. <laughs> what are the outcomes that we get here and why? And the first one is the parties actually don't want to solve these problems. They'd rather have them persist. If they solve immigration, if we solve gun control, just think of, of what the loyalists think. And the loyalists are, they don't want to solve it. They want their way. And as long as the issue is unsettled and, and, and un, un, unsolved, uh, the parties get tremendous support from their core customers. Uh, uh, the parties energize their core customers really by not getting anything done. It, it's perverse, but it's very smart if you're a party and you're trying to maximize your benefit. Uh, political dysfunction is not only on legislation now, but the parties have been able to spread partisanship to our independent regulatory agencies, to our executive agencies, where to get an important position in government now, civil service, yeah, that's, that's old school. Now you gotta be a partisan, you gotta be loyal to the party. Even the courts now have been infiltrated by partisanship because a nominee to the Supreme Court or some other court has to be a loyal partisan even to get that nomination anymore. And so this partisanship is spread beyond just the legislation and, and, and it affects everything that we need our political system to do. Um, and then I think the final thing that we have to understand, we just have to understand this, is that there are no countervailing forces building that are gonna restore this healthy competition. It's wired into the rules. It's wired into the reality of the nature of this competition and there's only one way it's gonna change and that's us. Now, to talk about how we might do that, and there are ways to do that, and it is starting to happen. Let me turn it back over to Catherine uh, to talk about uh, uh, what we need to do if we're actually gonna change this mess we find ourselves in. Thank you, Michael. We are almost to the optimistic part. <laughs> Not quite, though, because <laughs> I have a story for you. So two young fish are swimming along, and they meet another fish coming the other way who says to them, hey boys, how's the water? They swim along a little bit further, and one of them looks at the other finally and says, what the hell is water? And the point of this story is it's easy to forget that what surrounds you seems normal only because it's usual. And to others, these surroundings might actually seem rather strange, and our political system is to us like water to the fish. We think it's normal that this dysfunction is to be expected, and therefore we complain about it, but we don't fundamentally question the system because we actually don't really think it's possible to change. We think it's normal that in 2010, Mitch McConnell, then Senate Minority Leader, says his top priority is to make Obama a one-term president, and Nancy Pelosi, when she became Speaker of the House the time before, says her top priority is to elect more Democrats. We think it's normal that Speaker Paul Ryan, before he retired last year, said, and I quote, both left and right play on people's division and exploit their frustrations for political gain, not good, all this just to get a coalition that's 50% plus one. 
We think it's normal that both parties in turn have killed bipartisan immigration deals for political calculus, and we think it's normal that a billion dollars is invested in a lobbying index of companies that get the most bang for their lobbying buck, and this index has, over the past decade, outperformed the S&P 500 by almost five percentage points annually. We think it's normal that the richest country in the world had its credit downgraded because of partisan political gamesmanship. And we think it's normal that you can donate that 313 times more money to a Republican or a Democrat than an independent candidate. We think it's normal that only <coughs> Republicans or Democrats can be on a presidential debate stage. No independents. We think it's normal that when researchers at Princeton and Northwestern University examined congressional action on 1,179 policy issues, they found, and I quote, when the preferences of economic elites and organized interest groups are accounted for, the preferences of the Amer average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically insignificant impact on public policy. It always gets me. We think it's normal to have only two choices. And we think it's normal not to like any of them. And all of this seems normal because it's usual, but let me be clear. We should see the water we're in, and we should be absolutely outraged. No way to run a country. But the good news is that it really doesn't have to be like this. Political innovation, which is the lifeblood of any economy and industry innovation, political innovation can save us. So let's summarize the theory of change. In any game, board game, sports game, serious game like politics, you change the rules of the game and you change the behavior and you change the outcomes. Most of the rules aren't in the Constitution. It's a pocket Constitution. It's this big. They're made up. Our work has a comprehensive reform strategy with four pillars. But today, I want to talk about only the first of those because it's the highest priority, and it's available to us to make this change much sooner than you might think. And we must absolutely re-engineer the elections machinery. For this, I've got to back up a moment and tell you quickly about the key structural problems in our existing elections. First, partisan primaries we talked about. So that creates the eye of the needle problems through, through which no problem solving politician can pass. And they've got to keep their eye on their ideological far wing. The second, which we haven't talked about yet, is plurality voting. So in the US, elections can be won with only a plurality of the votes. So the winner has the most votes, but not necessarily a true majority. For example, in three-way race, you can win with 34%. You won, but 66% of the voters in that race preferred someone else. Plurality voting, it turns out, is an enormous barrier to new competition for two reasons. First, there's the spoiler argument. So sometimes we don't vote for the candidate we really want out of fear that our vote will inadvertently help elect the candidate that we like the least. For example, in 2016, you may not vote for Jill Stein because you will take votes away from Hillary and inadvertently help elect Trump. You also may not vote for Gary Johnson because you'll take votes away from Trump and help elect Hillary. And currently, you also can't even begin to think about voting for Howard Schultz. And not only that, Howard Schultz, who's exploring an independent run for president, you're not only not supposed to vote for him, He's not supposed to have the right to run. <laughs> Politics is the only industry that claims that less competition is actually good for the consumer. And this, to me, begs the question of how could you spoil a system that is already rotten? The other problem with plurality voting is wasted votes. So there's spoiler problem, then there's wasted votes, which is to say, even if you're not spoiling because your candidate has no chance of winning, you're wasting your vote. These two problems, partisan primaries and plurality voting, are a key reason why we don't have healthy competition. They're the reason why most potential new competition never makes it to the starting line. They have a few meetings with political consultants. They understand the dynamics, and they're out before they're in. The two elections innovations that we propose, when implemented together as a package, solve these problems. And they fundamentally change what politicians are incented to do. Elections machinery 
reform, number one, is to institute what we call four forward primaries. And here's how that works. We eliminate the partisan primaries where we vote only in the Democrat or the Republican primary. And instead, when you go to the primary, there's only one ballot. Every candidate, no matter their affiliation, Democrat, Republican, Independent, is all on the same ballot. So you're not voting the Democrat primary or the Republican primary, you're in this nonpartisan primary. And the top four finishers out of that primary automatically advance to the general election. Four forward primaries eliminate the eye of the needle primary problem and allow legislators significantly more leeway to legislate in the public interest. Combine that with election machinery reform number two, which is to institute ranked choice voting in general elections, and here's how that works. So now, the top four finishers from the four forward primary are on the ballot, and now I show up at my election, and I see my four choices, and it's very easy. I pick my favorite, just like always. But then if I want to, I can also pick my second choice, my third choice, and my last choice. I can rank as many or as few as I want. So here's my ballot in a ranked choice election. I like the musical, so I'm picking Alexander Hamilton. And then, George is my second choice, Thomas Jefferson my third, and I'm not a James Madison fan, apparently, so he's my last choice. The polls close. The first place votes are counted. And if a candidate has a majority, a true majority, over 50%, the election is over and that candidate wins. But if the leader falls short of 50% plus one, then technology enables instant runoff voting. And the last place candidate is automatically eliminated. And if I voted for that candidate who's now out, my second choice is counted instead. The votes are now counted again, and the process continues until you have a true majority winner. So it's basically a series of runoffs, but instead of having to keep coming back for another election, you cast all your votes at once. Ranked choice voting eliminates both the spoiler problem and the wasted vote argument and ensures that we always elect the candidate with the broadest appeal to the most number of voters. And these are not, by the way, crazy new ideas. Australia has voted this way for over a century. And back in 2002, Alaska had a referendum on the ballot to implement ranked choice voting. And at that time, a famous politician recorded a robocall in support. Let's listen. Hello, this is Senator John McCain. I'm calling to urge your support for ballot measure one on August 27th. As a presidential candidate and as a senator, I've worked hard to open up the political process for all Americans. Ballot measure one will adopt a fairer voting method. It will lead to good government because Alaska will elect leaders who have the support of a majority of voters. Please vote yes on measure one on August 27th. And also in 2002, Illinois Senate Bill 1789 proposed ranked choice voting for their congressional and statewide primaries. The sponsor, then State Senator Barack Obama. John McCain, Barack Obama, two talented politicians and devoted public servants who knew how the game is played. They were ahead of their time on these reforms, but now that time has come. And together, these reforms open top four primaries and ranked choice voting will powerfully alter incentives. So let's go back and reimagine Congress post-election machinery reform. Now, when a member of Congress is presented with that same opportunity to sign the big bipartisan compromise legislation, they can vote yes if it's in the public interest. They can say, oh, well, under the old system, I never would have made it back through my primary, but I think... I'm pretty sure that I can be in the top four. I'm the incumbent, I'm popular, I'm known. I'll be in the top four. And then, in the general election, with a combination of first and second place votes together, I will be able to craft a win. So elected officials now owe their election to a broader group of voters and are incented to be responsive to the entire district, not to a narrow swath of primary voters and special interests. And additionally, the existing incentives for scorched earth campaigning are reduced. Most importantly, the barriers to entry are dramatically lower for new competition, leading to healthy competition to serve the public interest. Let's go quickly back to our Venn diagrams. Remember this one? Under the current rules of the game, there's no intersection, no connection between acting in the public interest and the likelihood of getting reelected. 
after we implement these election machinery reforms, we see a different diagram. Here it is with the solution. We implement four forward primaries, rank choice voting general, and create that intersection. And then actors in the politics industry are incented to do what we as a country actually need them to do. And that is the true power of political innovation. So what's next? Well, we need to pass these election reforms across the country. The Constitution delegates virtually everything about elections to the states individually. There's two methods for change. One that you have in California, the ballot initiative, and that's about 26 states can do it that way. About 24 states need uh, to pass legislation. And these efforts are in the works at an early stage across the country. You guys actually were an early mover when you went to top two nonpartisan primaries, and that's a precursor idea to this more optimized uh, theory. Maine passed ranked choice voting in June. I actually woke my daughter up after midnight at her request to tell her that it won because she knew, because I told her, but she knew <laughs> that this was the most consequential election of her lifetime to date. And campaigns are being created across the country, including here in California. Before we close, it's important to note, we do have other challenges outside of the election machinery. There are other reforms we should undertake. We had those four pillars, I didn't even get into them. But this is the necessary first mover, and these reforms will enable others allowing our system to improve over time. Historically, the American political system was a critical foundation of our nation's success, but today it stands in the way of every important issue we need to address. Yet we have, I believe, every reason to be optimistic, even perhaps profoundly optimistic, because our dysfunction is not a mystery. And we have more leverage in the system than perhaps we knew. This country was founded, and the greatest political innovation of modern times and political innovation is the key to our future. And I'd like to close with an invitation to action. Thomas Jefferson is said to have said, now my HBS fact checker says he didn't really say it, but it's still quite good. So he said, <laughs> we don't have American government by the majority. We have American government by the majority who participate. And historically, I thought and I suspect many of you thought, that that means we have to participate by voting. But it turns out that it also means we have to participate in the design of the rules of the game. Remember Benjamin Franklin, when he was leaving the Constitutional Convention, a woman asked him, so Mr. Franklin, what have you given us, a republic or a monarchy? And Benjamin Franklin replied, a republic, if you can keep it reclaiming the promise that is our republic, the United States of America, is the challenge of our times. And together, we can do this. So thank you so much for having us here today. And we're gonna take some questions. Great. Michael, you wanna oh, come I'm over moving. here? Yeah. Okay. You're in Richard's seat. Thank you. Well, hello, I'm Richie Borders from the Financial Times, West Coast editor. And uh, first of all, um, our thanks to Catherine Gale, a former CEO and now political innovation activist. And, uh, you know, the emotions that you feel, Catherine, I think are things that we all feel. And so, you know, it's a very passionate um, presentation today. And I think you've really opened, you know, lifted the lid on something that we all care really deeply about. So our real thanks to you. And also to Michael Porter, economist, uh, Harvard's uh, Business School professor um, for that. Now, I, uh, I've got a few audience questions here. Um, I'm going to try and summarize them. We've, uh, we've, you've opened a can, of, a can of worms on a huge area here. Um, let me get something <laughs> out of the way. First of all, it's very personal to me. So you didn't mention the role of the media here. I've got a couple of questions from the audience. What is the role or the responsibility of the media here? And how do we fix that? Well, let me just start and then Catherine can build on it. I mean, it, there, there was a time when the media, most media were independent. And the media's job was to sort out and make, you know, analysis and recommendations and be dispassionate about, you know, what's the best path here. 
And now, of course, what's happened is the media now has kind of synced up with the duopoly. And some media are on the left and some media are on the right. And what they're doing is just reinforcing that message, that ideology, that point of view. Uh, so the media is no longer playing its, its fundamental role in this country. And uh, the, the question is, you know, how do we restore this? And I think it's going to have to come from the citizens. It's good business. Lots of people like to watch these shows, you know, and it's outrage and crazy stuff is going on every second, 24-7. But, but ultimately, that's not what we need our media to do. We need our media to educate, to help people understand what's actually in their interest, as opposed to what people are telling them, which is often not. And, uh, and, and that role we have to reclaim. So, Richard, it is such an important question. We'll get the question about media and money and many other things that people think are the real, you know, problems in our system. And one slide I didn't show you guys is another Venn diagram. I really like them. And I'll draw it here for you. So one side is powerful, powerful, and the other side is achievable. And that is the criteria we used to determine which reforms of the political system should be in our strategy. So in order to be in our strategy, a reform has to be powerful, meaning it addresses the root cause of the dysfunction according to our industry analysis, and it has to be achievable. Theoretically, we could measure success in years, not decades, so constitutional amendments need not apply. And what this does is allow me to not answer a lot of questions because what I say is, the, if we were able to change the media, it would be powerful. Could be, you could change it even powerful bad. I mean, the media is powerful. If you were able to change money in politics, it could be powerful. But none of those things are in achievable. So we don't have a lever as citizens to pull collectively in the next couple of years that would transform the media in some uh, sustainable and wholly systemic way, whereas we do have in the others. So I... Now, we have the luxury of not concerning ourselves with things that aren't in that intersection, even if they are very powerful, unless they're both. Right. So um, I'm going to summarize some questions here that apply to how you know, your thinking, your framework applies to what we're currently seeing in our politics. And um, in particular, whether you know, some, of the, some of the things we're seeing, are they symptoms of the malaise or are they possible solutions uh, where do they come from? And so this really falls into two areas. One is President Trump, um, who hasn't figured as much in your presentation, perhaps, as he figures in the minds of everybody in the audience here. But to a lot of people, he is the, uh, he is the disruptor. He's the uber of politics, right? He's come in and disrupted. Um, so um, doesn't this show that the barriers to entry are falling? And, um, you know, there is room for disruption, and people want disruption. Such a great question. I want to say it's actually the first time that we've been asked about Trump in the many presentations. It's still super relevant, but it is interesting how once you get into the dynamics, sometimes we can let some of the drama go. Having said that, I have thought what the answer is, which is he's absolutely a symptom of the dysfunction. And as a friend of mine says, and I'm sure you've heard, you know, he is the um, wrong answer to the correct question. But actually, his election really demonstrates that this analysis is sound because he wasn't really a Republican. And yet, given the high barriers to entry, the only way that he could compete right. is to stage sort of a, a hostile takeover of one of the two officially sanctioned competitors. So if he ran as independent, he never could have been on the debate stage, for example. I mean, so... He came in and took it over. We're in favor of new competition, but we need more competition, not just intra-party competition, which is what we've seen with Trump. So, so he's done a reverse takeover of, yes. rather than bring in the third brand of cola, he's just done a reverse takeover of Coke. There you go. And he's just accentuating yeah. the partisan competition rather than changing it yeah. in yeah. any fundamental way. The other, the, the, the other range of questions that kind of center on this, this area, I suppose, is... Um, uh, one, one audience member asked about socialism. How do you think about you know, the discussion about socialism now? Is that, because in your analysis, that would, that would sound like it's a symptom of parties pushing people to greater extremes, and yet to an awful lot of people in this country now, 
what you know this feels like a grassroots movement to and i hate to use the expression take back control which is something that you know that the nativists and the populists use but that's how it feels to the people on the ground so how do you feel about that well i mean let me just very briefly say mm -hmm. that socialism has never worked in any country at any time in the world uh, and uh, we have lots of examples where it hasn't worked it doesn't lead to better prosperity it doesn't lead to good things it leads to often a lot of very difficult things but I think people are so frustrated and have no, un no understanding of why this is happening and can't see the kind of strategic thinking that if we could apply that, we could actually get what we really need, which is solutions-oriented uh, legislation and government that would actually help us solve these many problems. Uh, uh, but instead, they're, 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 they're reaching out, they're lashing out. And, and looking for uh, some something that's going to be magic, and uh, uh, but it, it's 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 not real magic. It doesn't really work uh, in this particular case. But uh, that's at least my my take. I, I've done economic development all over the world. I've studied every kind of economy. I've worked in every kind of system. And uh, I think uh, the people that are hoping that socialism is an answer, I think, are unfortunately are going to be disappointed. And if no. if I could also add, uh, so that we don't sound too Pollyannish, as if you know what we've put up here creates some kind of utopia. Many of you will know that Winston Churchill said, you know, democracy is the worst form of government out there, except when compared to all the others. And I think the same could be said of capitalism. You know, it's the worst economic system except when compared to all the others. What we are talking about here, if we implement uh, even all four pillars of reform, does not create some kind of utopian government where it's easy to deal with the difficult trade-offs. I mean, candidly, if it were easy, even our current system would have done it. Democracy is messy and hard, and probably, again, capitalism too, messy and hard. But what we have right now is messy, hard, and really bad results. With these reforms, we'll still have messy and hard, and we'll have better results. Messy, hard, and better results. That's actually what utopia is for democracy and capitalism. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, the US isn't the only country with a dysfunctional political system at the moment. Your accent betrays you, yes. The accent tells it all. I forgot my Union Jack tie today. On, <laughs> this is after a Brexit day that we're speaking on. Yeah. Um, but I, we have several questions here about Brexit, which is obviously uppermost in people's minds. And it does seem to be a spectacular example of a political decision that's been driven by one party for the benefit of one party. Um, so, um, but this suggests that, you know, obviously we can't look at what you're thinking in the framework just of how US politics has developed. There are other forces at work. There are bigger, bigger forces at work that are driving politics in this direction. Um, and so how much of what is happening is beyond the framework that you've discussed of a particular duopoly that's been developed, you know, has developed as these parties in the US have wanted it to develop and actually reflects bigger forces that are beyond maybe the solutions you're talking about? Well, I, you know, I would say that, that every political system has a different structure. Mm. Um, and we're not experts on, on the British system, but uh, what we see is the competition that emerged among the parties uh, was a competition based on a fantasy that if we just dropped out of the EU, then everything, all the problems would be solved. We're done. And, but the fantasy was, was, was foisted on the citizens with, without actual truth in terms of the assumptions and the data and the analysis. You know, British citizens were told that being part of the EU is costing us a lot of money. And in reality, the Brit British, the UK was getting more money from the European Union than it was putting into the European Union. And, and there's just a whole litany of things like that where the parties kind of manufactured an argument about what's good that was simply not factually correct. And, and now that things have happened, it's dawned on uh, the experts that, that, that's, that we're on the wrong side of the issue. Uh, and the most important competitive advantage of the UK as an economy was the fact that it was part of the EU. And they had English speaking, which made it very attractive to a lot of global companies, but yet you're in the EU. 
And now that they've taken away the key competitive advantage, then it's really hard to figure out what to do next. So, so again, it's, it's the same kind of question of what's the structure, how are the parties interacting with, with each other, how are they educating the people on what their choices should be. Again, it's a false choice, be in the EU or not. I mean, that's not the way to think about it uh, from a rational economic point of view. So, Catherine, you may want to contribute to that. Well, I would expand back to this broader question of whether and how this theory, this type of analysis applies to other uh, you know, non-U.S. countries. And as Michael said, we haven't done that work, but what we can say is that it is highly likely that there is a political industrial complex that has arisen in every country. And there will certainly be rules of the game that they are making up along the way. And that all countries need to look at this design. Again, constitution is you know the tiny pocket part of the design, and then you'll have everything else that ends up driving the behavior. And we think that the key message that this has, the macro message, is look carefully at all of the rules and the machinery, legislative machinery, elections machinery, that collectively create the incentives and the systemic drivers of behavior in any system. And you will find perhaps something different in many countries, and they have constitutional constraints on which of these reforms, for example, they could put in. But all democracies will have to continually confront that question and revise the rules of the game to fit mm -hmm the larger context. Yeah. So let, me, let me just add one really important point. The people in the system are always going to be trying to optimize it for their benefit. And so we have to be vigilant, you know? And the US had a terrific system for many years, enormous progress on all these dimensions, but it got captured bit by bit. And somebody decided that we'd put in this rule and that we changed the fundraising rule. and. Uh, one of the things we didn't say is America has no independent regulation of our political system. They can do anything they want. There's no review. There's no, no uh, accountability to the FTC of politics. They can choose to compete however they want. Uh, and in fact, the only regulator in politics is called the Federal Election Commission, the FEC. And it's the most fake regulator <laughs> in the world because it has three members of one party and three members of the other, and nothing at all ever happens unless they all agree that they yeah. want it to happen. So here's their tool for agreement and collaboration to make the competition better for them. So, uh, you know, you've, we've got to understand the political system, you just can't leave it alone, you just can't let things happen. The things that happen will all rarely be good. Well, we're, uh, we're, we're getting towards the end of our program. The, one last question, which really, picks up that point and is, as you can imagine, is the main question that I think I've, you know, we've been getting from the audience today, which is how we change things, uh, uh, whether we have to trust the politicians to unrig this system and how much we can do. And you've emphasized that it's up to us. It's up to us to act. Um, and yet, uh, you know, the actions we can take are very much at the margin in individual cases, taking actions collectively, individually in various ways. Um, one of the very strong messages I, you know, I, I got from your paper in the Harvard Business Review, and I'd strongly recommend everybody to read that because it's, it's a very interesting paper, but it is that when we tweak and change our political system, we get all kinds of unintended consequences. And so without blanket reform, you know, isn't there a risk here that we're going to be rushing out there trying to turn the knobs, take back certain areas, and yet we're going to end up with a worse system than we've got? Always a risk of unintended consequences, and some of the problems we have today are unintended consequences of the, of the progressive reforms of the early uh, 20th century. Having said that, our house is burning. We need to get out of it. And we can't stay here just because maybe the other house is burning. Like, for sure what we have doesn't work. And mm. <laughs> in any of our organizations and our lives, we do rational things, which is we say, do we like what's happening? And if not, what do we think would be the right way to move forward? We are not paralyzed by the fact that we might be wrong. And we might be. I doubt it. But there's that possibility, but it doesn't keep us from you know, taking the action. And as far as what we can do, what's really exciting about that Venn diagram of powerful and achievable 
is that there are great things in that diagram. Now, there's nothing at the intersection of powerful, achievable, and easy. Okay, so it's still hard, but it is achievable. And that gets back to you know, my introduction of John Pimentel, who in California is working with IVP. So you don't have to take, um, you'll have to take an individual vote, but you can take action collectively to get these reforms on the ballot in a binding, you know, what do you call them here? The proposition, whatever you're gonna call it. And you can pass it. And these reforms are likely to have a tipping point. Like in, a same, uh, in the same way that a movement for marriage equality started state by state and has a tipping point. And the other one thing I want to note is that what I love about For Forward and RCV is that you don't have to see it implemented in every single state in the country to actually impact, for example, Congress. Because picture this. If you had 10 states sending 20 senators to Washington, D.C. under these rules of the game, where they're accountable to everybody in their state, they're a fulcrum that keeps either the Democrats or the Republicans of having what we now know as majority control, which then controls things like their own Senate version of the Hastert rule. You have a fulcrum of people answering to the public interest, even if they're not from every state. And that already alters the competition. Very good. Well, we should finish it on a positive note. So I think we ought to cut it off here before we- <laughs> Oh, okay, out. that's good. <laughs> Any other avenues? So uh, thanks to Catherine Gale, a former CEO and currently a political innovation activist, Michael Porter, an economist and a professor at the Harvard Business School. Um, we'd also like to thank everybody here, as well as our audience on the radio, television, and internet. Uh, this has been a joint program of the Commonwealth Club and the University of San Francisco School of Management. Uh, I'm Richard Waters of the Financial Times, and now this program is adjourned. Thank you, Richard.